In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly King, Paraclete, Spirit of Truth, You who are everywhere present and fill all things, Treasury of all that is good, Master of life, come, dwell within us, cleanse us from all stain, and save our souls, O good one. Uh, in this first section, I want to uh, continue reflecting on Verbum Domini. We're in the middle of number seven. Uh, and this is very beautiful. As I was saying that prayer to the Holy Spirit, I thought how appropriate it would have been to take some time to comment on that prayer. I will next time. You see, Vasilev Oranie Paraglite you see all these beautiful titles of the Holy Spirit, huh? Um, and they're all biblical. O Pantau, Pantaku Paron, Keta Panta Pliron. You're everywhere, and your Pliron comes from the Book of Wisdom. You fill all things. El Theki Skinosin. Come and pitch your tent. Skino from Skini in Greek. Tent. Come pitch your tent in us. And cleanse us, you see. It's a beautiful prayer, but we'll do it next time. We should get down to business here. <clears throat> we were talking about the Word, and the Word who is Himself, and then the Word expressing Himself in the Scriptures. And now there's a, a pause. When we go back and look at the Word expressed in creation, while the Christ event is at the heart of divine revelation, we also need to realize that creation itself, the Liber Naturae, the book of nature, is an essential part of this symphony of many voices in which the one word is spoken. You see, in the biblical tradition, I mean Jewish and Christian, God really speaks. In the Muslim tradition, they envisage that the whole thing was written and then handed or dictated to, to uh, uh, Moses. Huh? Uh, but here there's a personal engagement. So that when we understand that creation itself is a personal engagement, this is what Paul means when he's talking in Romans 1 about uh, how people should have known, and he's borrowing all this, Founding it, I should say, rather than borrowing from wisdom 13 and 14. If you really look at the universe, you hear a voice. You see that this wasn't all made by itself. The greatest challenge of our own day, <clears throat> with this loss of the sense of transcendence, you see, is to try to reduce every explanation to mechanics. But, you see, Nature is a book. Nature is a book. We also profess our faith that God has spoken his word in salvation history. He has made his voice heard by the power of the Spirit. He has spoken through the prophets. The prophets, as it's used there, includes Moses, not just Jeremiah and so forth. All the prophetic activity is to interpret history. That's what it's for. It's in the events huh, that God acts. Um, there's this famous phrase, I think it's Rupert of Deutz, says, Audivimus historiam, we've heard the story, in queramus mysterium. Now look at what God reveals in this act in history, whether it be the Exodus or the heal, Jesus is healing of a blind man, or whatever. You see, it's God speaking. Remember last time, we, we looked at that text in Hebrews, opening line. In varied and many ways, God spoke to our fathers in the prophets. Now in these last days, he spoke in his Son. The whole life of Jesus is a speech. It's a communication. It's a desire to communicate and to have a response because a word needs a response. 
This all comes down from heaven in a book, and here's the book. Thank you very much, I'll read this. But if it comes in an address, then you need a response. So that's what's being said here. See? He has spoken through the prophets. God's word is thus spoken throughout the history of salvation, and most fully in the mystery of the incarnation, death, and resurrection of the Son of God. That's a language. It's not just an event. And that's why the historical work is so precious. But it can also shortcut. You see, it isn't enough for us to reconstruct the event and then use our reconstruction to interpret the text. That's what they mean by historical, critical work. You know? is to, to gaze on that event and have it enter our spirit. Huh? Especially, I mean, take Jesus turning water into wine. Then read carefully, as we did, uh, John's account of it, where he sees the deep language. He translates for us that event and that speech that is that event. So that's what he's saying here, you see. Then, too, the word of God is the word preached by the apostles in obedience to the risen Jesus' command. Go into the, all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. It always moves by word. Now, some of these words are actions as well, but it's communication. And you notice, because all of this is called the word of God, verbum domini, you see, it's an invitation to a dialogue. If I pass you on the street and I know you and I say, hello, I expect you're going to say, hello. Not, what does Hello. And so, this event reaches us. Huh? Uh, it's a mystery. And it's the deep dimension of it that is the mystery. And so, uh, the Word of God is thus handed on in the Church's living tradition. The subject of interpretation. Who interprets the Scriptures? The Church. The whole Church. There is this beautiful description of this development of understanding the apostolic preaching in De Verbum number 8, where it says, that the uh, apostolic preaching makes progress, progreditor is the word they use. See, first, by the prayer and contemplation of the faithful who ponder these things in their heart. Like Mary. That's how all of this grows in understanding. The second, by the intimate understanding that they re that people have uh, because of the, 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 we'll put it, the deepest understanding of the realities which they experience. It took a month to get that word experience into the council text because of all the associations with modernism and all the rest. But we need it because that's how we learn. And finally, by the preaching Bishops aren't excluded from the first two. It's just that in addition to the first two, loving contemplation, experience of divine reality, they have an, a very official charge to preach it, to let it be known. You see? So this is that's the Church's living tradition. A mother teaching her child to bless himself, herself is an instrument of tradition. See, it's the living reality being passed on. Uh, okay. Finally, the Word of God, attested and divinely inspired, is sacred scripture, the Old and New Testaments. When Vatican II opened up, there was this big question. What's the source of revelation? Scripture or tradition? Actually, it's tradition as expressed in the inspired word of Scripture. 
and then carried by the rest of tradition and safeguarded by the magisterium. See, the magisterium isn't so much a cop as um, a prophetic function that protects the word from getting lost or falling into aberration. It's a, it's a prophetic function. We need all that, huh? because without the Holy Spirit, in a half hour, we could mess up the whole church. You know, Maybe 45 minutes, but you know, we could do it. We're not bright. So, all of this helps us to see that while in the church we greatly venerate the sacred scriptures, the Christian faith is not a religion of the book. It's a religion of the word, but not a religion of the book. Oh, that's what he just says. Christianity is a religion of the word of God, not of a written and mute word, but the incarnate word of God. Incarnate and living word of God. That's a quote from St. Bernard. Consequently, the scripture is to be proclaimed, heard, read, received, and experienced as the word of God in the stream of the apostolic tradition from which it is inseparable. When scripture causes knowledge, it's itself. And we've treated of those before. How St. Thomas says, you know, it's like no other book. Every other writing, God instructs us immediately through the mediation of the book. St. Thomas' Summa, or whatever. Or Tolstoy, or whatever. In this, you see, he instructs us immediately. He himself takes the realities expressed by the text and impresses them on our spirit. Then we know them. And after a while, with a little bit of experience, we know what we know, and we know what we've just read. And there's a difference. I know what I know, and I know what I don't know. And when I have to preach on a text whose reality has never entered my spirit, I have to pray. I have to talk about the reality, not the words. In fact, <clears throat> the famous line of Luther's, <clears throat> Qui non intelligit res, non potes sensum ex verbis elicere. If somebody does not know the reality, they cannot get the meaning out of the words. Very profound. That shows you why we need faith. All right, we're going to move on a little bit. As the Sinner's Father stated, the expression Word of God is used analogically, different levels of meaning, and we should be aware of this. The faithful need to be better helped to grasp the different meanings of the expression, but also to understand its unitary sense. God speaks. It's white light. And then in the life of the people, it's refracted into red, orange, yellow, blue, green, indigo, and violet. But it's all one light, uh, refracted, or a symphony, or whatever image you like. From the theological standpoint, too, there is need for further study of how the different meanings of this expression are interrelated, so that the unity of God's plan and within it the centrality of the person of Christ may shine forth more clearly. Because, you see, the Word of God expresses the Word of God incarnate our Lord Jesus Christ. There's so much beauty to be found in this uh, sacred text. All right, uh, we're finished with our in little meditation. Next time, we're going to talk about the cosmic dimension of the word.